welcome to today's Wired Briefing, How to Win at Hybrid Working. I'm Natasha Bonnell, Wired's business editor. Now, remote, hybrid and flexible working have become the norm for many office workers around the world, raising new challenges and new opportunities. But how can you measure someone's performance effectively if they're working remotely? What does productivity even look like? And what occasions definitely require gathering people in person? And how should people management processes adapt to meet the needs of asynchronous teams? To answer all these questions and more, I'm joined by Nick Hederman, who leads the modern work and security business from Microsoft UK, and who is an expert at helping individuals and organizations to become more productive in a flexible work environment. Welcome, Nick, it's great to have you. Great to be here, Natasha. All right, so you've been doing this for over three years at Microsoft, so I feel justified asking you to delve straight into answering a question that I know a lot of business leaders have, which is basically, you know, how how can you measure productivity effectively when people are working in a hybrid environment? It's, it's, a, it's a really interesting question, and I think it's a question that a lot of leaders are grappling with right now. Yeah. I mean, before the pandemic, many ways in which people would measure productivity is walk into a walk into an open office and see people, yeah. uh, and that was the sort of the gut check. You know, are, are, is my team working hard? Um, but that is not the reality anymore. You know, people have got used to that flexibility and are looking for better work-life integration. Mm-hmm. And organizations right now are struggling with that thought. In fact, we saw in our Work Trends Index report that whilst 87% of workers felt very productive, uh, as productive, if not more productive than the pandemic, only 12% of leaders felt that they trusted their teams to deliver on productivity. Mm-hmm. So there's this massive chasm actually between these two, two cohorts in a given organization. And the organizations that do feel good are ones that have got the data uh, mm-hmm. and the insight and also create clarity with their own, within their own organization when there's a clear expectations set at the top and everyone understands how they contribute to those expectations, then you create much greater clarity and also got much greater trust between these two cohorts of, of workers. Mm-hmm. And how, because obviously you've got that chasm between workers and business leaders, you know, workers have always argued you know, we we've work, we work better independently. You know, you don't have that aspect of walking around the office, as you say. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to salary and performance, how do you, if you're not able to work around the off, walk, walk around the office as a, as a business leader, how do you measure that? And how are you able to, you know, show that you can match those two things without knowing exactly what everyone's doing? Yeah, I, I think I mean it's it's, it's important. That it's, this isn't about monitoring people. Yeah. You know, privacy is a is a human right and should be respected as such. And it's it's incumbent upon every leader and every organisation to think of it in that way. Uh, but certainly, starting to measure outcomes and not hours is is probably one of the biggest trends that we're seeing, and 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 helps with 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 ultimately solving that challenge. You know, if you're very clear about what are your objectives as an organisation, how does everyone's role contribute to that? What are the expectations of the individuals at that level we know what are the key results you're expecting to get out of those individuals uh, and then having an open and honest conversation about tracking the impact against those objectives through regular connections through one-on-ones through reviews um, and then you start to create a, a much um, higher higher level of trust a climate of trust and also individual accountability because then quite honestly it doesn't matter where I'm sat to get my work done I could be sat in a coffee shop I could be on the beach if it if it really allowed <laughs> if I was allowed to um, <laughs> Um, uh, uh, but um, you know, then then it's about then it's about focusing on the outcomes, not the hours. So that's something really interesting because I don't think a lot of businesses necessarily thought that way, uh, measuring mm. outcomes rather than you know just sort of walking around and saying I know this person's doing their job, they're putting in their hours. Um, it, I, I suppose does that change the kind of targets and objectives that people should have because. It's, it's a different kind of ball game, isn't it? Rather than saying you've completed these projects or you've completed these bits of work, you're trying to measure the impact that that work has had, which is That's a right. different kind of thing, right? It is. And, it, and it, funnily enough, it's it's a methodology we use here at Microsoft. So I'll give you a little insight about okay. that in a, in, in a second. <laughs> um, but I think what it focuses on is 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 not activity. You know, you can be you can be very busy doing lots of things, um, but they not they may not accrete to anything of interest uh, or, or impact, especially aligned to some of the objectives that you might have agreed up front with your manager and your leaders. Um, and and so I think what it does is it really helps the individual to focus on what's the priority, what's the, what's what what how should I be spending my time in 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 support of those 
objectives. And as I say, we, we use the model here at Microsoft. I and mean, in fact, we actually measure, measure three different types of, out, uh, of impact. Okay. We measure the individual's productivity and, and impact against things that they've said they're going to do. But we also look at how are they helping other people to be successful. So that encourages collaboration. And we also measure the um, impact of how the individual is leveraging the work of others as well. So those last two are really important because they really promote that sense of team and, and working together, helping other people and also learning from other people as well as doing your own work. And so we think about those three sort of circles of impact. It really is a bit of a, a sort of a Venn diagram. Uh, kind of, you can still imagine them all sort of overlapping together. Because if you get that right in those three circles, then you really start to drive um, very, very high level of, of, of impact as an, as an individual. What impact, just, just, just thinking about Microsoft in particular, what impact has the, have those two extra points made in everything? Because obviously working more effectively as a team and helping other people, again, things that might not have been happening before hybrid working, maybe people weren't thinking in that way. Has that had a tangible impact from Microsoft's teams? You know, we know from um, experiments into asynchronous working that when you do things as, together as a team, the output is always better mm -hmm. because you have different perspective, you have different thoughts, you have different creativity. And so um, it, the same same sort of principle applies here. You know, if you're leveraging the work of others or if you're, if you're asking others to help you, the outcome will be richer. It will be better. Yeah. Uh, and we see that. We see that time and time again. And so it's not about being the master of the knowledge that you have in your head. It's not about owning all the information and saving it and, 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 and only sharing it at the last minute. This is about working out loud. It's about collaboration. Uh, and it's about bringing the thought and the perspective and, and the, 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 the input and the creativity from many different people across the organization. It also reduces, um, you know, overlapping work. You know, mm -hmm. if someone's already created something already, great. Let's just start with that and make that, that yeah. <laughs> as opposed to having to start from fresh every single time. Yeah, that's really good. I mean, one of the things you mentioned earlier, which I thought was it touched upon so much of the reporting that we've done at Wired, uh, when you talk about people that look busy, uh, mm. but don't necessarily, when you're looking at measuring impact, don't necessarily fall under the category of someone who's doing very well. Now, we, we've seen, um, obviously, the, there's this reporting on sort of middle management, and there's lots of people who whose job is basically to have meetings, right? And they felt a little bit at sea during, uh, you know, the, the pandemic lockdowns when it wasn't possible to go into the office. Um, now there's a movement towards bringing people back. Um, and, and I wonder, you've got all these people who have now set themselves up into a new system where they're being measured on the impact that their work has in a business. How does going back to the office or being forced back to the office impact that? Is that, is that something that is, is playing out right now? Yeah, I mean, we, we see this in the data. We do the, this this um, global study called our Work Trends uh, Index Report, and we saw this very clearly in the data. There is there is demand for humans to be together with other humans. It, it's not a surprising thought, right? Um, <laughs> no. You know, I think it's 80, 85 percent of people said they they value the thought of of, of coming together and, and, and getting together and, and strengthening their team bonds mm -hmm. the challenge that many people are facing is it this sort of the worth it uh, equation mm -hmm. uh, in fact half of the people that are currently hybrid today are actually considering going fully remote based on their lived experiences of, of of making that effort getting on the train getting in their car cycling to that office location getting there and being very disappointed with what they see you know the people they wanted to connect with they're just not there and they spend the entire day on their laptop on on digital meetings sending emails and quite honestly well it wasn't really worth it that that, that commute wasn't worth it wow. uh, and so there is a there is definitely a need for a combination of, of policy and culture but also i think technology plays an enabling role here to help people to understand when uh, to make the effort um, and and you know we talk about this as a bit of a selfless act because whilst you may be perfectly capable of doing your job um, you might have been doing your job for years and you've got a great brand and reputation and network and knowledge there are those that are newer to the organization they might be early in their career they might have just joined from a different industry and mm -hmm. for those people especially having the knowledge network around uh, is so important and it's so much easier to extract knowledge when you're sat next to someone or you bump into them in the corridor versus you know taking a proactive effort to start something over a digital form and so that that notion of, of being together to be creative to collaborate to connect and being selfless in the act of others in your team is really really important and we think the office is is, is it plays a critical hosting role for that for that scenario
Yeah, it's interesting, though, because a lot of the conversations around returning to the office and, and what you just said, if I don't I don't necessarily think a lot of companies have had that conversation with, with workers and saying, look, this is our reasoning behind you coming back. This is why we think it's so important. A lot of the time people mention culture and serendipitous moments and they don't necessarily delve into well, why is it that we need to be there in person? Why can't we have all of these moments, you know, on, on different different on teams on zoom on you know on slack on, on whatever tool that you're using for, for the office um i suppose it, it's difficult right because they're not necessarily saying like why is it three days rather than two why why does everyone have to be in at once um do you feel that there is a, a communication problem going on um, I, I wouldn't say there was necessarily a communication problem. I think we're, we're still very much in the early days of learning how to do this effectively. Mm -hmm. I think what we've definitely seen in the last six to 12 months is mandating specific days in a location does not work. That, that mm -hmm. sends a very bad taste in everyone's mouth. And it doesn't necessarily allow for that serendipity. Um, I think things that have worked is, is getting down to team level agreements. Because mm -hmm. like, uh, every team is different in an organization. So every organization is different. Um, there's no one size that fits all, depending on your geographical nature, the customers that you serve, the size of your organization, the industry you're in. Like in every single variable changes what every organization looks and feels like. Um, but also every team within an organization has different expectations. You know, if you're a sales team, the, the expectation is you're out with your customers probably quite a lot. Uh, if you're in finance or HR and you're doing a lot of the sort of back office work, then actually there's probably some benefits to being in a, in a physical location together at the same time. So it varies by team. And so the, I think the recommendation we would have is, is team level agreements at, at the, with the manager of that team saying, what are the, what is our operating model? Um, for working remotely and also working uh, together in person and it, it you know that team should be empowered to make the decision but there uh, i come back to that concept of selfless acts here you know mm -hmm. you, you've got to you've, everyone has to agree on that um, team level agreement and stick to it so if the team agrees that it's once once a month that they come together in person and for the rest of the month they're digital that's that's good. But for that one day, everyone needs to make that effort to be there. Right. And so it's about holding everyone to account um, to, to those to those agreements. Yeah, you can totally see how that could fall apart if you don't get the buy in from everyone, because you'd be like, oh, I'm really sorry, I'm sick today or I can't possibly come in. And then suddenly again, you've got the people, as you mentioned before, that come to the office and sat, sit down and, and there's no one around that, that they actually do need to talk to. I suppose. For, for those crucial days or those crucial moments when people have agreed that they're going to be there in person, yeah. what kind of what kind of things have you found are like the most productive to do? Because you've got off, uh, you've got offices that decide, all right, we're going to do some you know exercises together, some team building exercises. We're not going to work as normal. Uh, what, what kind of things do you think an in person presence is crucial for? Yeah, I mean, the, the way we think about it in in my team is we're a digital first organization. So we say digital first, but together with purpose. And I think that word purpose is the most important point here. There's got to yeah. be a reason or a purpose for that for that meeting. And, and I'm sure every organization, every leader will have found those things that create purpose. They might be all hands presentations or town halls where you get everyone together. And that's, you know, certainly we find at Microsoft that's that's one way to pack the building. Um, you know, because there is a moment it might be related to, you know, the, you know, the end of the, the calendar year and Christmas celebrations, for example, it could be start of a new fiscal year, for example, and kicking things off, you know, it, it, I'm sure it would depend on the organization as to what that would look and feel like, but also down to, you know, team level um, agreements and team level moments. Um, but then in, on top of that, I think, I think creative creativity is probably the most important one to think about, you know, when you are physically together, um, creation and ideation flows in a, in a, in a more meaningful way than it does over, over a digital forum like this. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think knowing that if you've got a purpose to achieve, let's say you've got to, to whiteboard or, or ideate on this new particular project, or you're kicking this particular project off and you need to have stakeholders together for that moment, getting everyone aligned, et cetera, then there's a value in being together. And therefore that's the moment that's, but it, but it also drives back to the point around just just good meeting etiquette like what's the agenda what are the expectations <laughs> of this moment being together what are the outcomes we're expecting so it actually forces you to do that more um, and as a consequence i actually think managers and leaders are becoming more professional in terms of events management really you know that's really what yeah. we're doing in more and more times we're thinking about these moments as events they could be big 
broad scale events that have have production involved, but they could be down to a you know a team level creative meeting. You've got to think about producing that. You know, have we got the right room? Have we got the right stakeholders? Have we set the agenda in advance? Have we check people that are actually going to come in for it because they see value in it, uh, and and so forth. So that there is a lot more effort, I think, in 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 defining those together moments. And that can be really, really good because often, I suppose, even, you know, before hybrid working became such a widespread thing, a lot of people were stuck in loads of meetings that didn't really seem to have a purpose, right? So, yeah, yeah. so this, this could be a good way to kind of be like, okay, exactly. let's be more yeah. thoughtful about it. Yeah, yeah exactly. And so I'm, I'm also intrigued on, on how, like, the evolution of digital tools will work out then because, mm-hmm. you know, Microsoft has a suite of offerings on, like, how to manage work and how to make you know business a lot more effective but I'm interested in, in again like looking at how that's being used internally at Microsoft see if you can give us a bit of best practice so yeah for example, sure. like, how, how do you integrate like new hires and how do you how do you sort out you know the, the this organization of when to be there in person yeah there's a few there's a few things that we've been um using and leveraging um firstly we have something called microsoft fever which is our employee experience platform Mm -hmm. um and it has a number of different capabilities or modules within it um so i'll give you an example of a a couple of them um just to sort of bring that to life the first one is something called viva learning um this is our new um experience that, that brings together all your existing learning content um and allows you to to consume it and to share it within teams um, so think of it very much as a front end for all of your learning. And what we've seen actually since we've deployed it within Microsoft is um, one, the modality or the usage has really increased on mobile. So people are, are using their phones as a way to consume their learning content, um, which is not something we saw before in the past when we had it on a legacy SharePoint uh, site. But we've also seen a real intri- increase in the number of non-mandatory courses, so elective elective learning, people actually in going and looking at the catalogue of courses, some of them just five minutes long, you know, from LinkedIn Learning on how to be a better presenter right the way through to really you know technical and and deep sort of subjects we're seeing uh, on average uh, 56% of people doing two or more um, proactive non you know elected learning co- bits of content thanks to the technology and ultimately what we've seen is it's just brought learning out into the into the flow of work into your day to day it shows up beautifully within teams as thumbnails there's some ai behind it that knows some of your interests and 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 learns from courses that you've done in the past to actually suggest things just mm-hmm. like you would experience in in your sort of day to day life with other services it's actually got a recommendation engine there and it's helping you to become a better learner uh, it's helping you to do it in the flow of work it's helping you to take it quickly and also if you like the course then share it with others very simply through teams so that's one example of how we're enabling this you know sort of hybrid way of working with with a greater learning uh, emphasis um mm-hmm. Another one which is really important to us is Viva Insight. So this allows us to see what's happening within the organization. I see my own personal insights, you know, who am I connecting with? How many meetings am I doing? Am I multitasking in meetings? As a manager, I also see my team's insights. You know, how how often have I connected with them one-on-one? Um, what are some of the trends I'm seeing? Am I seeing people working longer hours or or after hours work? And I must I must sort of reiterate here: this isn't about individuals and and tracking individuals. This is looking at trends. In fact, I have to have a minimum of five people in my team to even see the trends of the team. So I'm I'm not p- calling out individuals. I'm just looking what are the overarching themes, and that allows me as a manager and a leader to go talk to the team and and get a sense of what's going on. So it's empowering me with the insight and the knowledge. And then at the organization level, we can see mega trends, you know, hundreds of thousands of people working together, you know, and there's some fantastic um, images and, and sort of diagrams you can create. It looks very much like a Wired article, actually, when you can start to see, <laughs> um, for example, a map of the country and, and and how are different roles all interacting with each other based on where they're located. Fascinating mm-hmm. insights. So you, but because we've got the data, we can create the insight. And then with the insight, we can experiment. And then we can also track and, and manage and, and, and optimize. And so that data is so critical. I think I mentioned that earlier. And, and that's one of the tools that helps us to do that. It's so interesting because it feels like it could tie together into this sort of matrix and, you know, everything you need to know. Um, I guess, is that does that make it easier to troubleshoot? So if you notice, for example, on a manager level that, you know, there's there's a problem there, like it, how quickly can you see that and action that? 
Well, it allows you to have a conversation. Um, <laughs> and so you, just because you have the data and the insight doesn't necessarily mean you know exactly what's going on. I'll give you examples. Um, I saw a massive um, uh, increase in, in after hours work in my team for a particular period of time. And so then I asked the question, you know, what's going on here? And it was because we had an event coming up. So that allowed me to think, actually, there was a, there's, a, there's a lot of extra work going on beyond the typical um, sort of range that we would see. And so as a leader, I'm thinking, how do I make sure that I just balance that workload off the back of that event, you know, give people a bit of a break? So it allows me to be really, really smart. Yeah, it does feel like that kind of bridges that gap that we were talking about at the very beginning of sort of it, workers saying, we feel like we're really, really productive and managers saying, I, I don't really know, 12% of yeah. them are like, yeah. oh, you know, uh, I'm not really sure. I think I think they are. Um, that sounds yeah. good. Yeah. Whereas this kind of gives the definitive answer to that. Um, I, I guess my, my my question here, and you've got you've got the learning elements, you've got your your sort of in person uh, meetings mm -hmm. or events. Um, when it comes to integrating new people into a business, obviously you don't have any preliminary data, you don't have any history for mm -hmm. them. Um, that you might give them some learnings, right, so that they can learn specific courses or perhaps there's internal things that you might set up so that they have sort of that initial induction. But how does how does that continue with with new people that might not, you know, have that sort of culture of the organization? They might not know, you know, how it is that you think or what your insights are or what you're what you're expecting from them from the very beginning. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great and it's a very broad question. And I think there are some there are some just good things, good practices that any organization should, can do in terms of having a really strong onboarding plan you know yeah. I, I always like to have two mentors for any new starter so that they've got someone to talk you know at least two people to go talk to um documented we've got a one note that we have that shows all the different steps we want to go through as the manager and also as the individual the, the sort of the stages of onboarding uh mm -hmm. that we, we would we would like people to take so there's just sort of standard practices like that i think any organization can do very quickly mm -hmm. um Full of technology, I think, um, can augment and support that even further. Um, you know, we talked about learning, for example. As a manager, I can curate those learning paths for that new starter in Viva Learning and then pass those off on day one so they can start working through uh, those as an example. The other things, and uh, you know, we talked earlier about um, setting objectives and being really clear about what it is, um, uh, you know, we're expecting of this new person to the organization. Mm -hmm. So being really clear, I mean, we use the OKR methodology uh, extensively in, in the organization. So we're very clear about what are the objectives that we want to see from you? What are the key results that we're expecting? And how we, you know, the key results allow us ultimately to measure. Um, and then we put those in something called Viva Goals, which then allows that individual to see how their work contributes to the broader organizational um, uh, objectives as well. So from day one, you're like, oh, I can I, I can see how I'm going to have impact on some of the bigger, broader company objectives as well. So I think that creating clarity is really important, too. That's really nice as well, because often there's objectives that are set at the beginning of a year or at the beginning of, of joining a, a business and then you sort of leave them <laughs> yes that's right and, and and so the beauty of this is you can see it all the time yeah. you know it's, think of it a bit a bit like a sort of a tree diagram you can you can go right away from you know big big company objective down to my work and it's all automated as well so you can start seeing the impact of your work tracking and and the, the impact it's having further up the chain and so it's a very empowering way to uh to get a sense of you know how am i contributing to the organization as a whole or to my team for example it doesn't always have to be at an organizational level you could do it at a team level as well that's that's another option Mm -hmm. I want to uh, kind of do a little bit of a step change because I'm interested in hearing about your thoughts on, again, something that, that people are considering is, is bridging that gap between uh, sort of going somewhere physically and, you know, wanting to have more meetings in person, mm -hmm. but not necessarily having those those in-day um, occasions to do it. Um, especially, I suppose this is relevant for people who don't live in the same geography and therefore can't make yeah. it to the same, to the same office. Um there's talk of, of, of like how the metaverse could impact the way that we work in an office. Mm -hmm. what, what's your take on, on the role that virtual and augmented reality could play in, in all of this? Because again, it could help, you know, whether it's new starters meet new people that are in different geographies and get to know them really well. Um, but it could also help to bridge those moments where you just can't get people in the same space, right? Yeah. yeah. You can't get them it's a, it's a fascinating topic um and we will i think we will always agree as humans that being physically together in person is the is the premier experience uh, yeah. the one we would ultimately seek 
Um, but if you say, like you say, you know, geographically challenged, or there might be some other reasons for why you can't be there in person, two dimensions is it only takes you so far. And so there's a gap between those two experiences of, of being together and, and, and the form that you and I are engaging today in, which is that sort of two dimensional view. And so we do think there's a role actually for the, for the metaverse. Um, and I think it starts to enable you to, to go into that third dimension, to be physically present with someone, even though they could be millions or thousands of miles away in a different location. Uh, and there are a number of benefits that come with that. You know, you can you can start to uh, share more of sort of the interactions of, and the emotions. You could be speaking in your native tongue uh, and the AI could be translating into the language that the, the other person speaks, for example, and, and therefore you could be speaking together without having to know each other other's language. Uh, you could be looking at three-dimensional models, for example, you're bringing those into the meeting you could be doing something as simple as a whiteboarding exercise where you're all stood around that whiteboard together you're, you're moving post-it notes you're you're, you're annotating uh, and you're creating that whiteboard environment but yet you know you're not you're not physically in that in that place so there are there are many different um, benefits that we think would, could come from from having a a metaverse office in, environment and um, some of the steps uh, towards that um, that we have recently announced is firstly you need to create yourself as an avatar uh, that's step number one and in fact, very soon you'll be able to show up as an avatar in a Teams meeting mm -hmm. as opposed to being, you know, on camera. Uh, there are, by the way, some instant benefits to that uh, in the two dimensional world in that if you're getting a bit of camera fatigue and you but you don't want to turn your camera off, showing up as an avatar is actually quite a nice in between. <laughs> scenario so, so I think, <laughs> yeah a bit of respite yeah so um so i think just playing around with how you show up as an avatar is is stage one mm -hmm. uh, and then stage two is um is going into those more immersive experiences and we we recently announced we'll be partnering with meta and their quest devices to bring teams immersive mm -hmm. experiences into the quest metaverse and we're building out you know the, the capability to be able to do that within the m365 suite you know you'll be able to go into teams but you know at metaverse teams meetings you're going to be able to bring in the m365 apps like powerpoint or the whiteboard or, or, or a word document or the browser and and start interacting with those technologies in that in that 3d environment so yeah. we do think it's a really interesting area um and you'll definitely see microsoft continue to invest in that over 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 the years ahead yeah, so it's so interesting because obviously that I suppose the big challenge is just I suppose usability and just for everything to be smooth, right? Because that's that's what you really want. You don't want the situation where you know. I remember sort of we we did a, an article recently about the people that are, are trialing some of Meta's uh, Horizon stuff, and it, it was the the case of you know at the very those who started at the very beginning were saying, oh, you know, at some points, you know, my my clicker stopped working, or you know that the, the um, avatars would sort of stare at you <laughs> slightly, <laughs> which was it was a format that has been ironed out since, but it feels like it's it's getting better and better right and and I suppose it's about finding that seamless thing where you can just click on one link and you're in the metaverse and you're in like an office space with your with your colleagues right and you're able to sort of just go from there and have your presentation yeah yeah I mean when I was at school I had a BBC computer and and look at the laptop I'm looking at today you know <laughs> and so I think if you apply the the, the 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 trends in technology to something like the metaverse we should we can only expect it's going to become you know more more interesting capable advanced just through the na the nature of 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 technology technological advancements quite honestly so you know it it is early days i think everyone appreciates and knows that like you yeah. say some are experimenting right now and 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 seeing the benefits of it and and so the potential uh, scenarios that can it can enable um and i think it's it's definitely one to keep watching and 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 seeing how it evolves quite honestly sure sure i mean listen in this entire conversation we're kind of assuming that everyone is doing the right thing which I think is very nice of us to assume that. But I suppose a lot of businesses may have already, you know, decided to implement, you know, a lot more stringent return to the office days, or they might not have invested in the right thing, um, whether it's tools to work in a hybrid environment in an effective way, or maybe they haven't yet invested in anything, any infrastructure. Um, I suppose getting that wrong at this point can create a variety of, of problems. I mean, what's what does one do if one has made those wrong investments or has, you know, done a bit of, because it, it's all experimenting for everyone, right? No one right, really yeah. knows what's going yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you, you you hit the nail on the head in the fact that this is one big experiment and no mm -hmm. one has the answer quite honestly at this stage. You know, we've, we've learned 
ourselves at Microsoft, there are some things we've done that we would do differently as a consequence. And that's just the, that's the spirit of experimentation, right? Mm -hmm. I guess, as any good scientist will tell you, you've got to be able to measure an experiment and see the impact and the outcome of the experiment to know whether it hasn't worked. So I think if, mm -hmm. if anyone is just blindly going into experimentation without any good methodology, then that perhaps yeah. is an obvious place to start. Like, how, how can you measure the impact? And I would, I would come back to data being the key thing here. You've got to be able to measure and, and have the data to create the insight and make decisions on, on whether those things haven't and, and haven't worked and that's probably i think the most important thing but but just being open-minded to the fact that you've got to trial you've got to try things out and, and see what sticks and see what works mm -hmm. but one thing is clear that expectations from employees has definitely shifted um mm -hmm. the, the the 2019 school of leadership just simply doesn't cut it in 2023 anymore mm -hmm. so what kind of mistakes have you noticed companies are making right now well, I think mandating days certainly has backfired in, in many organizations and subsequently people have, have sort of retracted from that in many in many cases. Um, uh, I, I think that's, that's that's probably the the one that, that sort of jumps out the most if I'm, yeah. uh, if I'm being honest. Um, and um, and and just assuming that you can just go back to how things were in the past, I think is another one. Uh, and it just simply it's it's not the case you know we we ev everyone has seen the impact of that higher level of flexibility and also that that it doesn't matter necessarily where you are to get your work done it's it's about yeah. it's the how when and where of flexibility that's now on many people's minds and so not respecting that i think is a is a big problem and and we've seen it in 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 the last sort of 12 to 24 months of people who aren't getting what they want are voting with their feet they're looking for yeah. it uh, and you see it time and time again. And, and you now see it actually in the attraction of new talent. If you go read job descriptions on LinkedIn, you'll see a lot of people talking about their flexible work policies and using mm -hmm. that as a tool to attract the best talent and and also retain the talent as well as well. Yeah, so I, I think they're, they're probably the main the main things that I've seen. Um, I'm sure there are many others and I'm sure everyone <laughs> can think of their own things that they've done that would, would they could do differently. But um, yeah, like I, I think just the, the, the spirit of experimentation is key here. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of people who go, let's just forget that we ever did that. <laughs> that, was, yeah. that was not a good <laughs> idea. Um, did, did you think, because I, I suppose when the pandemic first started, you know, many people fell on the on both sides of the divide about the future of work. There were loads of people that, that were like, you know, this is temporary. Mm -hmm. We are going to go back to the way things were. Um, at the time, what, what were your predictions? I mean, did, did you feel that if it hadn't been such a prolonged period of time, that maybe we would have just bounced back to the same habits and the same ways of old yeah that's a that's a great question I, i'm not sure i know the answer to that because it's it's so hard to say <laughs> but it was definitely a reset moment for everyone um and uh and and i think it, it just shone a light on the the art of what was possible it <laughs> actually and I, I think about my own lived experience in microsoft was very much a hybrid organization prior to the pandemic we measured on outcomes not hours we, we had great flexibility. We enabled everyone with the right technology and the tools to be able to work flexibly. Um, we encouraged people to be out with their customers or with their partners or, you know, meeting different, um, you know, organizations to, to improve the way they do their work. And so actually on day one, when lockdown kicked in, really the only thing I had to do was just not think about getting in the car anymore or jumping on the train you know, I just just had to stay in that that home location very little changed actually um yeah. now it has subsequently kind of got us to think about a few things uh, as a consequence I wouldn't say we were perfect before uh, and we're still learning as an organization but but it, I, I think it just reinforced the the culture that we had already created um but for many organizations that was brand new and I and I guess it's 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 opened that can of worms it's allowed people to have a little a little sort of look and feel of what it could be like uh, with full permission um and so I think that's a that's, that's an amazing thing and and so it's what what do organizations and what do leaders do about it is is the question and I'm you know, we're, we're, we're a good 12, 18 months into this journey now, and I'm sure many have experimented and tried a bunch of different things, and we're not there by any stretch of the imagination. But I, I think it's it's we're getting to that sort of sense of equilibrium between knowing that we've got to be together in person, knowing that there's value in that, also empowering people with the flexibility, having the tools, having the data, having the insights to try and create some sort of resemblance of, of a hybrid work environment.
I think it's really it's really interesting because for a lot of people, it was a huge shock, right? That they maybe might have toyed with the idea of hybrid working or flexible working, but it was always hypothetical, right? Whereas yep, yep. this this sort of uh, this this period has certainly been a period of experimentation and forced experimentation. It's it's been a force of change, right? Mm-hmm. I suppose once this is all over, um, and this this period of of experimentation is is done, and people have set themselves down a path whether it's you know the right path or the wrong path or or whatever whatever workers see it as being um what what do you think will come next what 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 period do you think we'll enter into next well (laughs) well i think you touched you touched on one of them earlier right if we think about the the increase of technology and how that can enable people to connect in a virtual environment i think that's definitely one trend that will enhance the hybrid experience, uh, whether that's in the two-dimensional form through, you know, a, a, an experience like Teams, um, or through the three-dimensional form and, and the metaverse. So that's, I think, that's definitely an enabler of a different type or an evolving type of of communication and and, and collaboration. Um, uh, and maybe just some resettings of expectations and norms of of how to be together and the value of actually being together in person. I think is another thing that will. Uh, perhaps become a bit clearer over the next couple of years as people start to get that balance right. Um, you know, those, 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 those networks outside of your core day to day have suffered as a consequence of not bumping into uh, that person in the hallway, that serendipity that you talked about uh, a while back. So I think there's, there's some sort of resetting and rebalancing of that togetherness, which, which I think will, will evolve as well. I suppose my last question, cause we're running out of time is, is about, the future, uh, because it, it kind of ties into to your answer about you know how people will start thinking about things uh, moving forward. And I, I guess if you have to think about twenty twenty three, and bearing in mind we're still in this period of experimentation, uh, what do you think the key kind of elements or trends that we're going to see of the, of the future of work might be? And, and this is this is open. There's no wrong answers, but I, I'm interested in, in thinking because you're you're at the forefront of this for Microsoft. So I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts of what are the kind of things we're going to see this year? So the, the way we we talk to our customers about it is really thinking through um, a, a bit of a framework. Like, what are you going to do with your people? How are you going to empower your people to be flexible? How do you give them the right tools and the capabilities to do that? Then thinking about the place of work, how do you think about the office locations? How are they? How are you using them for creativity, but also giving people the flexibility as well? And then some of your processes, like how do you automate in this new hybrid work? How do you bring workflow into the flow of work? And how do you use artificial intelligence to take care of some of the more menial tasks to free up time to be able to focus on the more creative things? So they're kind of the, the three areas that we would typically discuss we think technology plays an enabling role in in all of those areas um and it's got to be secure it's got to be compliant it's got to be cloud powered um but also i'd say leadership and and culture are also critical in this as well like what are what, what are you doing as a leadership organization how are you how are you creating the culture and the acceptance and and the progression uh towards a more flexible way of working and then we've mentioned it many times but i'm going to say it one more time circling around the top of all of that is is that notion of experimentation you've got to keep trialing uh, new things and learning from it and some of those experiments can be small scale they could be within a team some of them could be organizational wide um but that's i think at the heart of of how you keep improving because mm-hmm. like like you say like we, we we've we've only gotten gone so far yeah. um and there is so much more that could be done as a consequence of uh of, of this reset moment that we had in in, in in the pandemic so this is this is perfect time for any leader to create a culture where there's highly engaged employees by the mm-hmm. way the, the 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 brilliant outcome of this is there is a there is very clear links in many different research studies that shows highly engaged employees leads to more profitable organizations so there's a yeah. there's a clear link between employee satisfaction and and, and organizational health um uh, and just just a, a a sense of culture that people are really proud about and they want to be part of and so i think it's i think it's a really exciting time to be leading change initiatives in any given organization no, no matter how big or small they are yeah, it's, it's fantastic advice. Just keep experimenting. Make sure that the people that are working for your organization are happy. And, you know, just just don't change the attitude, right? This yeah, is fantastic yeah. advice. All right, Nick, we've run out of time. Thank you so much for your time today and for sharing your thoughts. Um, if you enjoyed this session, please do check out other Wired virtual briefings at wired.co.uk. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Nick. Thanks, Natasha. Bye.